All right, welcome everybody. Good to see everyone today. And hey, we're studying about Jesus's healing crusades. Jesus's healing crusades. And we've been on this for quite some time. And uh, I suspect we'll be on it for a few more weeks. But uh, of course, we've been uh, going back and, and looking at uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've uh, been doing our best to chronicle his uh his healings and miracles that he did. And uh, I, it's been a blessing to me to go back and restudy this and, and, and be there right with him as he healed people and touched people. And uh, it, it's just, it's, encour- it's been an encouragement to me. And you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Bible says. So he's still healing today, just like he did 2,000 years ago. And we've seen him do that around here over the last you know, a couple of decades, and so he's still in the healing business. So um, remember our uh, main verse that we're using is Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And so uh, we've uh, used that as our our opening verse uh, each week. And uh, we've also noted that... uh, uh, the people came to Jesus to hear and be healed. They didn't just come to be healed, but they came to hear and be healed. And a lot of times the emphasis is just put on the healing part of it. But you have to remember that they came uh, to hear and then be healed. And again and again, we see in the scripture where emphasis is put on uh, the, the, the person that needed healing, it's put on their faith. It was their faith. Jesus would say again and again, your faith has made you well. And uh, we understand, of course, that it's the power of God actually that makes them well, but it was their faith that tapped into the power of God. And, uh, uh, and the hearing part is significant because we understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so people would hear about Jesus or, they, or, or sometimes their friends would hear about Jesus. Remember that fellow that they tore the roof off and they let that those four guys tore that roof off and let the paralytic down in front of Jesus, you know, and the Bible says Jesus saw their faith. And so uh, uh, but people would hear about Jesus and come to him or they would, uh, you know, they'd come to his his his. Uh, place wherever he was and he'd be teaching and they'd, they'd listen to him teach and, and as they would hear the word of God that faith would be produced in their hearts and then as a result their faith level would be there you know their, their, the faith level would be high and they'd hear, hear Jesus preach you know or they'd hear about him and, uh, and then uh, their faith would tap into the healing power of God. And so that's why hearing is so significant. Like I've been telling you, a lot of times people just want to come to be healed and you don't see the kind of results that, that you would like. It's, it's not enough just to come to be healed. You have to come to hear and then be healed. You understand that? And so uh, now last week we did we did deal with a, a situation that man at the pool of Bethesda. How many of you enjoyed that last week? I think that was some interesting things came out there. You know, there was pandemonium at the pool, you know, <laughs> where that angel would come down, you know, and stir up the water. And and uh, the first one in the water after the, the stirring of the water would be healed. You know, there must have been pandemonium at that pool, you, you know, because the Bible says there were what, five porches of sick people, you know, and uh and, and, and they were waiting for the moving of the water. You, you, you remember that. And you can only imagine the kind of pandemonium that would have been at that pool. And, and pushing and shoving. and oh, I mean, it just, just makes sense. And, uh, and, but the thing about it, about it is, uh, there was a fellow there that, uh, that Jesus healed... And remember the, the, the fellow said to Jesus, because Jesus asked him a question, do you want to be made well? And uh, the fellow said, sir, I have no man to put me in the water. Remember that? He said, sir, I have no man to put me in the water. And, and Jesus went and healed him anyway. And the thing we brought out there is in that instance there, it doesn't appear to me that that man had any faith at all. 
He didn't have any faith at all. Remember that? And Jesus healed him anyway. And so sometimes, and we see this in the Bible, sometimes the Lord will just bypass doubt and unbelief altogether and just in his, just a sovereign move of God, heal somebody. Now he can do that if he wants to. He's God, you know, he can do that. And, and you see that, but that seems to be the exception and not the rule. The rule is you, you hear the word of God, it builds your faith, and then that faith taps into the power of God, and, and that's, how, that's how it typically works. But there are exceptions, and, and that man at the pool of Bethesda last week uh, seemed to be an exception to that. You remember that? We talked about that. And, uh, and, and remember we brought out how Jesus, you know, he would go and he would heal the multitudes. But in that particular instance, he left... Great multitudes of people there at those at, at the pool of Bethesda, five porches full of a great multitude of sick people. He left. He he walked away and left all those people there sick. Remember that. And uh, now, did he have did he have the power to heal them all? Yes. Was it his will to heal them all? Yes. But 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 he didn't. Now, why didn't he? I don't know. Why did he just heal that man at the uh, that one man? I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't answer those questions, but I do know he went other places where the people would be uh, grabbing at him. Remember that grabbing at him to try to touch him and, 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 and all that and, and so on and so forth. And, and great multitudes would be healed. Now, you know, one thing I will bring up, it may be that at that pool of Bethesda, those people had more uh, more faith in the stirring of the water than they did in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have to be careful that we don't get our eyes off Jesus and on other things. You understand that? And uh, I, I don't know, I can only speculate, but you need to realize that Jesus didn't heal everybody everywhere he went. He just didn't. Now, you know, explain that, Pastor Terry. I can't give you the full explanation to it. I know, I know. Now, think about this. Now, this brings up a good question. Uh, in Nazareth, how many of you remember in Nazareth, his hometown? And he went in there and the Bible says that there he could do no mighty work. And why was it? It was because of their doubt and unbelief. And it's very clear. He did heal a few people there of some minor ailments. Uh, one, one translation says that he tried to heal people there and he couldn't. Now, can you imagine that? The Lord Jesus Christ, anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, uh, unlimited power. He had the anointing without measure. And he's there in Nazareth and he's trying to heal people and he can't. It was his will to heal everybody. He, he, he had the power, of course, but the Bible says he couldn't. It, it didn't say that he wouldn't, it said he couldn't. He tried to and couldn't. He, he healed a few people with minor ailments. Why didn't the people in Nazareth get healed? Because of their what? Their doubt and unbelief right now it brings up a question and I think this is a good question I, I, I've never really uh, uh, considered this question but I think it's a good question in Nazareth he could do no mighty work there because of their doubt and unbelief but if you look at Jesus in Bethsaida now not at the pool of Bethesda but in Bethsaida remember Bethsaida and some of those other towns, Corazon and whatnot, he went in there and did some of his most mighty works. Yet the Bible says those people didn't repent. Remember Jesus said, you know, if these works had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah that's been done in you and so forth, they, they would have repented and all that. How many remembers that? So, so here's the thing. In, in, in like Bethsaida and, and Corazon and those places, he went in there and they didn't repent, so that implies they didn't believe, right? Is that correct? Because if they'd have believed, they'd have repented. Is that correct? So they didn't believe, didn't have any faith, and he went in there and he healed people. He did some of his most outstanding and mighty works in Corazon, Bethsaida, and there, uh, th those towns and so forth. He did some of his most mighty works there. And we have no record that they had any, any doubt or, uh, that they had any faith about him, just full of doubt and unbelief, right? But over in Nazareth, he could do no mighty work over there because of their doubt and unbelief. Did, did you get that? And so that's a good question, isn't it? And here's the question. Why? 
in Nazareth, why in Nazareth could Jesus do no mighty work and their doubt and unbelief is, 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 is given as a reason? You with me? You following me? Shake your heads if you are. You following me? Yeah. All right. Okay. In Nazareth, he could do no mighty work. And the Bible's clear. It's cause of their doubt and unbelief. But over here in these other towns, they're full of doubt and unbelief. And he did some of his most mighty works. Now, I want to be sure that, that you get this. I don't want to go too fast here. Why is it in Nazareth, in Nazareth, where he, he had been brought up, where he, where he was raised, right? Where he was brought up. Is that right? Jesus of Nazareth. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth. That was his human name. In Nazareth, he could do no mighty work because of their what? Their doubt and unbelief. But over in these other towns, Bethsaida, Corazon, these places, over there they had, they had nothing but doubt and unbelief. And there he did some of his most mighty works. Now, I've never heard anybody ask that question before. And uh, actually, uh, the Holy Ghost asked me that question this week in prayer and study. He asked me that question. <laughs> never had any, I've been teaching on this for years. And I never have had anybody, any human being ask me that question. And I never even thought of it myself. I, all these years teaching on, on healing, I never thought of it myself. That's a good question, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, it's such a good question. I mean, the Holy Ghost asked me that and, and posed that to me. And let's go over it one more time. I want you to get it. In Nazareth, the Bible says he could do no mighty work because of their yeah. doubt and unbelief. But over in these other towns, they've got nothing but doubt and unbelief. And there he did some of his most mighty works. It's a good question, isn't it? Why, how, can, how can that be? Well, uh, here's, here's what I would give as an answer. Here's what I would give as an answer. You're waiting for the answer, aren't you? <laughs> you're waiting for the answer, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're, everybody's waiting, waiting for the answer. All right, well, we'll do our best, okay? All right. <laughs> now, the Holy Spirit didn't answer it for me. He asked me the question, and then he kind of led me to the answer, I believe, okay? Now think about this. <clears throat> Where was Jesus brought up? Nazareth. He was brought up in Nazareth. Is, is he the word made flesh? Yes. yes. Do we know that he lived by faith for, for all of his life? And in the 30 years before he came on the public scene of, you know, his public ministry and yes. baptized in the Jordan and all that. Was he living by faith? We know that he was because when he got baptized, didn't, didn't the heavens open and didn't, didn't the father say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, so, so in Nazareth, Jesus lived there for approximately 30 years after, you know, they came out of Egypt, you know, and, and remember when he, he, as a baby, that Joseph and Mary took him to Egypt and then they came back eventually after Herod died into Nazareth. Is that right? And so those people in Nazareth had approximately 30 years of the Word of God right in their midst. Now, Jesus didn't do any miracles or anything in, during that 30 years. His first miracle was turning the water into wine after he'd been baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the point is, in Nazareth, for 30 years, they had the advantage of having Jesus himself in the flesh right there with them. They were able to see the word of God for 30 years. They had the word of God amongst them for 30 years. Is that right? Yes. And they had that advantage of seeing him, talking with him, studying him. Studying the word's good, isn't it? Right? Right there with them. They had that advantage, didn't they? In Nazareth for 30 years, they had that advantage. Of, there was the word, Jesus himself. How many of you would like to be around Jesus for 30 years. Wouldn't that be wonderful, you know? I mean, you know, in that capacity, wouldn't that be wonderful? You get what I'm saying? They had that advantage in Nazareth of having the Word of God, Jesus, in their midst. You with me? But these other cities, Chorazan, Bethsaida, they didn't have that advantage, did they? 
They didn't have that advantage. They didn't have that light, did they? Isn't Jesus light? He's light. The light of the, 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 light of the world. So, so in Nazareth, for 30 years, they had the light of the world right there amongst them. Right? But Bethsaida, Chorazan, over here, they're in darkness. They, they, never, they didn't have that advantage. The Bible says, too much is given... I believe Jesus said this, too much is given, much is required. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. And so, when Jesus arose over here in Nazareth with the healing power of God, now, now he's, he comes back in there having been baptized with the Holy Spirit and power. He comes in there and they, they'd known him for 30 years and now he stands up and says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me and so on and so forth. Guess what? All of a sudden now, they're not going to believe that. They had all, they had him for 30 years, the, the, the light of life among them, and now he comes with the power of God, and they'd even heard that he had the power of God before he, he got there. They'd heard about other things he was doing, but yet when he's there, and he stands up and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, guess what happened? They, with that 30 years of light, Having been giving much, having been given much, right? They rejected him, didn't they? So much so that they took him out to the edge of the hill and tried to kill him, throw him off. Is that right? Yes. So you see, their doubt and unbelief was, was, was a heinous, terrible thing. Now, all doubt and unbelief is. But you see, they had, they had him amongst them for 30 years. They should have known better. They should have known who he was. They should have believed what he was saying. They should have accepted him. I mean, he's hometown boy right here who, who never sinned one time. I mean, you know. They, they, but they wouldn't accept the fact that he was now anointed with the Holy Spirit. And that he was the Messiah. They wouldn't accept that. Much we could say. The point I'm trying to get at here. You see they had light, didn't they? Yes. And they were, but over here in Bethsaida. Now they didn't have the advantage. Of having that light amongst them. For 30 years. And he went in there. And, and just like what he did. I'm convinced. Just like what he did at the pool. Of Bethesda. Where he. Heal that one man. We talked about it last week as we've said. And there was no faith there at the pool of Bethesda at all. But yet he just healed that one man. Just a sovereign move of God. He just, he enacted it himself. I believe that's what he did in Corazon, Bethesda, over here in these places. He just, he just, in his, in, it is a sovereign move of God. He, apart from their faith, in, their, in the midst of their doubt and unbelief, he moved in great power. And we know, we know why he moved there in great power. It was to get them to what? To repent. Because he said to them, he said, if these great works and, and, and had been done in Sodom and so forth, they would have repented. Right? So you see that, that, that their doubt and unbelief, he moved, a sovereign move of God, he moved in those cities that had doubt and unbelief. Why? To get them to repent. Now they didn't repent, but that's why he, he moved there, was to get them to repent. Remember Jesus said one time, if you can't believe for, I'll put it in my own words, if you can't believe for any other reason, believe for the work's sake. Remember that? And so, so I think that answers that question. You know, it makes me think about like back with, remember uh, the Ark of the Covenant? Remember the Ark of the Covenant? Remember when it fell into the Philistines' hands? Remember that? And remember the Philistines had no education in how to handle the Ark of the Covenant. And so when the Ark came amongst them, much we could say about it, but for the sake of this point right here, the Philistines didn't handle that Ark properly they had never been taught. They didn't know. Okay? And now much I could say about it, but just for the sake of this point, 
they, they didn't handle that ark as they should. I think at one point they put it on a new cart and you, or they put it on a cart. You don't put the ark of the covenant on a cart. It was to be carried with poles. You, you understand? by the priests and so forth. But the point is, when the Philistines mishandled that ark, now, now it caused them some issues and whatnot, but the point is, they didn't drop dead right on the spot. But remember when David eventually went back to get that ark? Remember that? And, 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 and there was two fellas. One of them was Ohio, and I can't remember the other one's name right now, but the point is, is they took that ark and they put it on a new cart but they knew better they'd been trained they knew better you see and and when they did it remember one of them remember when that donkey or whatever it was hit hit that hit that bump of the road and the ark began to began to you know fly, uh, you know began to go like that and remember the one guy Uza in Ohio I think the one guy Uza I think he str he reached out his hand to touch the ark you don't do that he reached out his hand to touch it. And what happened? He fell dead right on the spot. Remember that? Yes. See, he knew better. He, he had knowledge. He had to, much, to whom much is given, much is required. required. He knew better. He knew better. And he touched that ark and he fell dead right on the spot. But the Philistines over here, they, they no doubt touched it and put it on the cart. And, uh, uh, and they didn't. Now, in some ways, you can see God's great goodness in there. If somebody doesn't know a lot, God's going to be more tolerant with them than people who do know a lot and don't do much or anything with it. Did you get what I just said? Yes. So I thought that was a good example. So the answer to the question, why did Jesus in Nazareth, why wasn't he able to heal the people there because of their doubt and unbelief? But over here in these other cities, full of doubt and unbelief, he... Uh, he, he did heal and did some of his most, most outstanding works. Why is that? Because over here in Nazareth, more was required of them. They had the light of life among them for some 30 years. And then when he showed up with the power of God, they rejected him. See, you understand that? But over here in these other cities, they didn't have that advantage. Yet God moved in, the, in spite of their doubt and unbelief. The motive, of course, his motive is always to win souls. Could anybody say amen to that? His motive is always to win souls. And his motive, say, why did he do that? To get people to repent. And they didn't, but yet God gave them an opportunity anyway. God gives everybody an opportunity to repent. He just does. I said he just does. God gives everybody an opportunity to repent. But, uh, but so I think for me that answers the question that the Holy Spirit posed to me. Why he could do no mighty work over here. Uh, in Nazareth, but he did, you know, where there was doubt and unbelief. But over here, where there was doubt and unbelief, he did some of his most mighty works. I think I explained it. Are you okay with that explanation? Yes. Now, there's other things that could probably be said, uh, but I think that that uh, I'm satisfied with that. Okay, let's go to John the ninth chapter now, and let's look at this man born blind. Uh, how many of you are glad that you weren't born blind? Are you you glad you weren't born blind? Yes. You know, next time you're, uh, I was going to say, next time you're crabbing and complaining about something. Has anybody ever crabbed and complained about something besides me? Oh, yeah. So next time I'm crabbing, complaining about something, or, or you're crabbing and complaining about something, maybe that's, I could say that a little bit better, uh, but, but that gets the point across. Again, has anybody ever crabbed and complained besides me? Yeah. Well, here's what you do. Just close your eyes for about, uh, for about five minutes. And try to operate. Try to go about your business. All of a sudden, you'll get real thankful for... Yes. Huh? Yes. Yes. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, hey, be thankful you can see. Be thankful you can hear. Be thankful you can, can walk. Be thankful you can talk. You know, there's a lot of people can't see. A lot of people can't hear. A lot of people can't walk. Huh? So next time you're feeling down in the mouth, just look for something good in your life and be thankful for it. Amen. I'm glad I wasn't born blind. Amen. You know, I'm glad I was born where I can hear. You know, I'm, gl I'm glad. It, I'm, I'm just thankful. 
But this man was born blind. We're going to talk about him. John 9, verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now, how, how many of you know we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? So, so we all have. So this is, but the question here is, who sinned to cause the blindness? That's the question. Who sinned to cause the blindness? Now, Jesus says in verse 3, because, is, I mean, doesn't that usually come up as a question when somebody has a tragedy happen in their life? Or are there some sickness in their life or there's something like that? Uh, doesn't that typically come up, you know, what caused it? What caused it? Everybody wants to know what caused it. What did they do to cause that? What did they do? Did they, did they leave the door open to the devil somewhere, you know? I remember... A certain church where uh, whenever uh, the pastor, God bless him, but whenever something unfortunate would happen to one of the members of his congregation, he would always say, well, I wonder where they left the door open to the devil. Wonder where they left the door open to the devil. They must have let the door open to the devil somewhere. You know, that's a miserable place to go to church. I'll just tell you that. It just is. It just is. There's no other way to say it just is. And uh, but but the, the thing of it was, was that when something unfortunate would come upon him, he didn't look at it that way. It was, the, well, the devil's attacking me. The devil's attacking me. The, it, it wasn't where did I leave the door open to the devil? See, see, rules have to uh, apply all across the board. They have to be equal both ways, you see. But where did you leave the door open to the devil? Where did they leave the door open to the devil? Well, you know, it's clear. We saw it last week with the man at the pool of Bethesda after Jesus healed him. What did Jesus say to him? He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. How many remembers that? So in some cases, it is sin that opens the door to the devil. It is sin that causes the sickness. It is sin that causes the disease. In some cases, it is. But not in all the cases. Not in all the cases. Probably not in most of the cases. We live in a fallen world. We live in a, you know, our bodies are in a fallen state, you know. You just have to remember that. Okay? And, and we're all getting older, aren't we? My mama told me, don't get old. She said, don't get old. And I said, mama, how do I keep from it, you know? No, even as we age, we need to understand we can believe God and stand on the word of God. And there's things we can do to do to prolong our lives, like honor our mother and our father and different things and, and, and eat right and natural things we can do and spiritual things we can do. And, to, to, and, and of course, we have the power of God available to us, certainly. But how many of you, as you've gotten older, you've noticed some changes in your body? And, and, and it's not the devil attacking you. You understand that? I mean, you understand what I'm saying. Yes. But, but I, mean, I mean, would you like to attend here if, 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 if every time something went wrong with you, I, I would say, uh, where'd you leave? I wonder where they left the door open to the devil. That, that'd be a, that, you, that wouldn't be no fun, would it? No. And I've done my best to never do that to anybody. And you know why I do that? Because I don't want the next house to fall on me. Remember in the Wizard of Oz after Dorothy dropped the house on that first witch? How many remembers that? And then, and then later on, when the when the wicked witch of the west showed up, remember what Glenda said? Said, you know, be you know, be watchful, watch out, whatever you know, the, the, the house doesn't fall on you. Remember, and the witch looked up, you know. How many remembers that? And so I've never pointed the finger at other people. Now I did when I was younger, but as I've gotten older, I don't point the finger at other people because I don't want the next house to fall on me. You understand that? And it's thoroughly scriptural. Judge Jesus said, "Judge not, that ye be not what." judged okay that's the way Jesus said it the way you say it in Oz is watch out you don't want the next house to what fall on you so when somebody hits a hard time don't assume that it was well they just sinned or let the door open to the devil now they might have they might not have and really it's none of your or my business anyway is it is that right it's something between them and the Lord. Yes. 
And much we could say about that, but that simply put, that's enough said. Now, notice here in verse 3, Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now again, all have sinned, but he's talking about to cause the blindness. And he said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned to cause the blindness, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. This is verse 4. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now notice verse 6. When he said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is uh, translated uh, sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now I can say amen to that. Glory to God. Now, of course, the question comes up, why did Jesus have to spit on the ground? Why did he have to make clay from his saliva? Why did he have to put that clay on the guy's eyes? And why did he tell the guy to go wash in the pool of Siloam? Now, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Can I give you the answer to that? Yeah. I don't have the first clue. <laughs> I don't know. Why couldn't he just say, be healed? Or why couldn't he just say, be opened? Or why couldn't he just, you know, do that? Or whatever the case, wave his hand. Why, why couldn't, I don't know. He's God. He, he does what he does, right? Amen. And I've told you, and I won't go through them all now, but in this ministry over the years, and the healing lines that we've had over the years, sometimes the Lord would have me do, you know, normally about 90 Eight, ninety-nine percent of the time, you just lay hands on people and pray, pray generally, you know. But every once in a while, the Lord have me do some something unusual, and we I tell you what, when that would happen, uh, it, it, we we get, I mean, almost almost a hundred, not quite a hundred, but I'd say about ninety-eight out of a hundred results percent results. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yes. But uh, but why he did that, I I don't know, but he did it, and. Uh, didn't remember when the leper Naaman came to Elisha? Remember that? How many remembers that? And, and Elisha wouldn't even go out and meet with him. He sent his servant, I guess Gehazi, down to him and said, told him to go wash, what was it, in the Jordan, I think it was, seven times. And remember Naaman said, uh, Naaman said, uh, well, why couldn't he told me to go wash in one of the better pools? Why did he, or rivers or lakes or whatever? Why, why did he tell me to go to the Jordan? It wasn't the best place, I don't think, to, to, to swim in. Why do you, why do you go, why did God have Elisha do that in the first place? Tell him to do that in the first place. I don't know. But, uh, but he went and he dipped seven times. He had to be talked into it, but he went and dipped seven times. Now, why, why did he have to go to that place? You know why he had to go to that place? Because that's what the Holy Ghost was, was wanting him to do. Yes. Remember that? Uh, uh, why, did, why did Abraham have to go to that certain mountain range, that certain place? Remember where the ram was caught in the thicket? Why did he have to go to that one? Because God told him to go to that one. That's where his provision was. We need to be in tune to the Holy Spirit. We need to do what he tells us to do. If Abraham would have went to the wrong mountain, the, the ram wouldn't have been caught in a thicket there, you see. And, and, and if Naaman would have went to any other pool, it wouldn't have worked for him. Why did, why did Elijah have to go to the, to, the, to the brook Cherith? Why did he have to go there? Why couldn't he went to some other brook? Why couldn't he went to some other brook? Because God told him to go there. We need to be attuned to the Holy Ghost and go and do what he says do. And not question him. Did you hear what I just said? And not question him. I, I, I heard somebody say this last week. Remember when we were, it's so good. Remember when we were talking about that, that woman that came to Jesus, that Syrophoenician woman. And remember he, he, he called her, he called her daughter a little dog. How many remembers that? And I heard somebody say this this last week and it's so good. If Jesus calls you, if Jesus calls us a dog, you know what we, what we, our response is? If Jesus calls us a dog, you know what our response is? Bow wow. Can you say amen? amen? You don't get offended? You don't get upset? I said if Jesus calls you a dog. 
Now, if I call you a dog, you might sock me in the head, and rightly so. But if Jesus calls you a dog, how do you respond? Bow wow. Bow, wow. If Jesus tells you to go to the brook Cherith, you go to the brook Cherith, you don't question it. If he tells you to go to a certain mountain range, you go to that mountain range, you don't question it. If he tells you to go dip in the pool seven times or go dip in Jordan seven times, you don't question it. Can you say amen? You just go do it. And so Naaman went and dipped, you know, seven times. Aren't you glad? I bet he's glad he didn't stop on four, five, or six. You know, you, you, you do exactly what God tells you to do. A lot of people, God tell them to go dip in the pool seven times. They'll dip once and they won't see any results, so they'll quit right there. Or they'll dip twice, won't see any results, quit right there. Dip four, five, six, don't see any results, uh, quit right there. Dip six times, don't see any results, quit right there. No, 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 we, we dip, we dip. how many times did he say dip? He says seven, you dip seven and you get the results. How about circling Jericho? How many remembers that? You go around the city once, one time a day for six days. On the seventh day, you go, what was it, seven times and then blow the trumpets? Why, why, why couldn't God just, just huff and puff it, blow the thing down? Why did he tell him to do what he did? I don't know. That's what God wanted. God's, hey, last time I looked, God's running things, isn't he? You understand what I'm talking about? He's running my life. He's running. He should be running your life. We need to obey him and do what he says. And they go around the city, you know, once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they go seven, blow the trumpets and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, we need to obey God. How many remembers when they're crossing the Jordan? And, and he said, take the ark and go down with the ark first. The priests go down with the ark first. And once their, and once their foot, foot hits the water, then the, then, then the, the Jordan will part. How many people would say, well, we want the Jordan to part before we get down to the bank side? No, it didn't part until the priest, uh, remember it was at flood stage, it didn't part until the priest's feet hit the water. Is that right? Well, I'm talking about faith right here. We need to hear from God, get his plan and do exactly what he says do, nothing more, nothing less, and we'll see results. One people, one reason that people don't get results is they don't get his plan to start with. And then the second reason uh, that people don't get results is they get his plan, but they don't follow it out to the T like he says follow it out, you see. And so we need to hear from God, do exactly what he says do. So why did this guy here have, have to go wash in the pool after Jesus put the clay on his eyes? Because Jesus told him to, period. Game, set, match. And, and you do what he says do, and guess what happened? This guy came back seeing. Is that right? Just like the flood, the, the, the Jordan parted and, and Naaman came back healed of leprosy and there was a ram caught in the thicket, you know, and so on and so forth. And the, and the ravens came to the brook Cherith, you know. Why? Because people heard from God and did exactly what he told them to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And you'll see wonderful, great results, you see. And, uh, and notice this guy did exactly what Jesus told him to do. And he washed and he came back seeing. Praise God. Now look at verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors of those... Now how many of you thank God for the neighbors? You know? The, <laughs> All right. All right. Have you ever had some humdinger neighbors? Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? I mean, he got his sight back. Now he doesn't have to beg anymore. Some said, verse 9, this is he. Others said, he is like him. I mean, the neighbors are going to say all kinds of things, aren't they? But who cares what the neighbors think? Is that right? And he said, the guy finally says, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus. How many of you are glad for a man called Jesus? I tell you, I'm glad for a man called Jesus. I tell you, you can take the, those, those four words right there and you can preach a humdinger of a message right there. Just a man called Jesus. Glory to God. A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Well, that's not a good place. To <laughs> that's not a good place to take. People that just got healed. Now, well, and again, 
here we go. Verse 14, here we go again. Now it was a what? It was a Sabbath when Jesus, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. I think Jesus just waited and did things on the Sabbath to, to just stickle the Pharisees. I think, I, I mean, because it happens too much. I mean, it's again and again and again. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just stickle a little bit. He stickled them a lot. It's another Sabbath. Jesus is healing on the Sabbath again. Then verse 15, then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And this guy said to him, he, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. I mean, you think about that guy. That'd be pretty cool, though, wouldn't it? To have Jesus put, put clay on your eyes and so on and so forth. And that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Would you be crabbing and complaining because some of Jesus' spit is going to touch your eyes? Now, that'd be all right with me. Jesus can spit on me anytime he wants. Verse 16, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, now watch this. Now, here's a guy just got his sight back. And here's what they say. This man is not from God, talking about Jesus, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Think about that. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was division among the people. Isn't that sad? Yeah. They said, so they said to the blind man again, what, uh, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Well, I'm right with him there. I mean, he's, Jesus is a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He's the son of God, God the son. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him. Isn't that something? Oh, if I could just see blind eyes open, I'd believe. Well, they saw it and they still didn't believe. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20, his parents answered him and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is a, He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things, now watch this. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had, had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said to him, he is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. That's what they were saying. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse, 20, verse 27, he said, I told you already. See, they're trying to, they're interrogating him, trying to get a... Yeah. He answered them, I told you already. Remember, when the truth is the only thing you tell, there's only one version of the story you have to remember. Is that right? It's not original with me, but it's a good statement. He answered them, verse 27, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Good for this guy. He just kind of stickled them back. He became a soul winner right there. I, I, I like that. I've never seen that before. That's cool, is it? Do you want to also become his disciple? That's good. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. <laughs> Well, Jesus responded to that one time. He said, if, if you'd have known Moses and Abraham, you'd, you'd know who I was. We know that God spoke to Moses, verse 29. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, they should have known. They answered the man and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing. Now, the man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing. Uh, that you do, not, you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Verse 31. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does well, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard 
of that, uh, that anyone open the eyes of him who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Amen. Thank God that was his response. Amen. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, now watch this, you were completely born in sins and you're teaching us. Can you see that pride there? You were completely born in sins and you're teaching us. And they cast him out. They excommunicated him. I mean, and, and, and I'll tell you this. I mean, his parents, his parents wouldn't confess. They were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. They'd have been better off to confess Jesus and get thrown out of a place like that. And this man got healed, and instead of the religious people rejoicing, they excommunicated him, but he was better off. You want to get excommunicated from a place like that. There are some places you want to get excommunicated from, and this was one of them. This man was better off being thrown out of that temple, thrown out of that synagogue, thrown, being thrown out of that. He was better off because he got his healing. The Lord healed him. They should have been rejoicing. They weren't. They excommunicated him. And he's better off. I said he's better off because Jesus wasn't a part of that place. And you don't want to be a part of anything that Jesus is not the center of. Can you imagine being blind? And get healed. And because of that, you got thrown out. And this guy becoming... And, and I'll tell you what, I've never really seen this part of it. I've always put the emphasis just on the healing part of it, which that's where it is, I think. But something else I think we could mention is this guy was taking a stand for Jesus. And this guy, can you see where he's becoming a soul winner? We, we said that. I tell you what, you get excited about Jesus, you, you want to win souls, you'll get thrown out of a lot of churches in the United States. A lot of churches that are deader than a doornail, colder than a refrigerator. You're better off to get thrown out of those places. You know the book of Revelation, there's seven churches mentioned there, and, and one of the churches, I think it's the last one mentioned, in chapter 3 of Revelation, Jesus is on the outside of the church and he's knocking, wanting to get back in. Sad, isn't it? When Jesus can't even get into a church. And so any such church you want to get ex be excommunicated from. You want to be part of a place where Jesus is the central focus. Him and Him alone. And this guy got excommunicated, and he's better off. Amen. He's better off. And I, my advice to him would be just take the shoes off your feet, or the sandals, or whatever they were, pop them together, dust them off, and go right on down the road. Amen. Didn't Jesus say that? He said, if, he said, his, told his disciples, whenever you go into a certain place, if they won't receive you, you know, when you leave the town, dust, you know, knock the dust off your feet as a, as a testimony against them. Well, I tell you what, this guy is better off having, you're better off being with Jesus and getting your sight than being in an old dead synagogue blind as a bat. Is that right? I said you're, you're just a lot better off being with Jesus and getting thrown out and excommunicated of a dead place like that, of a dead dry place, you're better off with that, being part of Jesus, with Jesus, walking with Jesus, get thrown out of a place like that. Get your, get your sight. You get what I'm saying? Get your sight. Be with Jesus. Get thrown out. You're better off than to be part of something that's dead and dry and has a lot of religiosity, a lot of man-made religion about it. But not have the Lord. I want the Lord, how about you? 
Let's everyone stand. Hey, if you're watching on social media, the Bible says that anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want to just encourage you to call upon the name of the Lord. Receive Jesus as your Savior. You'll miss hell. You'll make heaven. And God will make your life worth living in the meantime. Well, thanks for joining us today. And God bless everybody. I trust. Uh, did you get anything out of this today? Yes. Did, did, did you enjoy it? Yes. Yeah. Did you learn anything? Good, yeah. that, was, that was an interesting question the Holy Ghost posed to me. Yes. Did you ever think about that before? Yes. No. no. Interesting, isn't it? Hope we gave you an answer. Okay. Well, hey, uh, they're going to shut me off here. So, hey, God.